just on the Order of Canada situation, I was invited to give a speech to a big um, pro-life meeting in um, the Maritimes out in the eastern provinces of Canada. And the guy who was introducing me went through a whole lot of, you know, the stuff that I've done and that. And then he finally came to the end and he said, and she has the honour of having been refused the Order of Canada. <laughs> and, and with that, it was amazing. It was a big audience and the whole audience stood up and started cheering. <laughs> so I was a bit disappointed that you didn't do that tonight. <laughs> Anyway, Paul only told me uh, about 48 hours ago what he wanted me to talk about. And because I don't even have a, I have no printer or anything with me, so for the first time ever, I've got handwritten notes that I'm going to talk to you from tonight. And um, essentially, uh, the question is, is euthanasia medical treatment? And it's quite interesting uh, about how that's being used because what Paul said is correct, that in Quebec under this, it's called an act respecting end of life care. Uh, and what that act has in it is what it calls medical aid in dying. And originally the Quebec government def redefined palliative care in the act as including medical aid in dying, which was a euphemism for euthanasia. And uh, the palliative care physicians were so upset about this that they all ganged together and the government backed down on that. So it's now, uh, it now defines in the Act, you can have palliative care and medical aid in dying. So at least it's been taken out of palliative care. But in fact, it will have to be medical treatment if it's going to be within the jurisdiction of Quebec to legislate on it. And this is a bit complicated, but the reason for that is that unlike Australia, where criminal law is state law, and so each of your states can decide what is murder and what isn't murder, in Canada, criminal law is federal law. And so the jurisdiction over criminal law belongs to the federal government. And so Quebec, if, it, if this is a criminal matter, which it is if you're killing somebody, that's what, I mean, that's what we're talking about, uh, then Quebec has got no jurisdiction to legislate on that. It would be contrary, it would be a, uh, outside their jurisdiction. And uh, what Quebec wants to do is to say, yeah. well, it's medical treatment and health and social services is a provincial jurisdiction. So they're saying it's a health matter and we can legislate on it. And I don't know how much any of you know about the politics in Canada, but we constantly go through, you know, are we going to be a separate country when we wake up in the morning? And, um, and so everything that Quebec can possibly legislate that flies in the face of federal power, they do, and then they have a fight about it. So what has now happened is that this act that's called an act respecting end of life care uh, has been passed by the Quebec Legislative Assembly that would be the same as the state parliament here in uh, Australia and uh, a big group of doctors and other anti-euthanasia people have now filed uh, a case in court challenging the constitutionality of that act. In other words, they're saying this is invalid provincial legislation. So we're in the midst of a huge debate. And I found it rather interesting because, you know, in Canada, the pro-euthanasia people want it to be medical treatment so that they can say that the provinces have got the power to legislate this in if they want to. And I was just looking at the Philip Nitschke case on television, and I heard him say, you know, one of his arguments for why he doesn't, he shouldn't be prosecuted in the way that he, or that he shouldn't be deregistered, is because he's arguing that this is not medical treatment. Therefore, it's not something that he's doing as a physician or as a doctor. By the way, in Canada, we use the word physician to mean all medical practitioners. I know it's confusing in Australia because you usually use it, I believe, 
I sort of, it's a while since I've lived here, so I get mixed up with the language between the two, but I think you usually use it as a specialist qualification. So, these are the questions that I just want to address generally, and then I want to open the floor to you to ask me what you want to know about this. Um, so, uh, I mean, the first question is, is euthanasia sanitized by associating it with medicine? Is that a way of making it more acceptable? Uh, the second question is, if, if so, should someone other than physicians, if we're going to have legalized euthanasia, should it be somebody other than physicians who carry it out? Is it euphemized by calling it medically, medical treatment and medically assisted death? And, and this is a question that's just coming up that a colleague of mine who's a respirologist, he's a lung specialist, um, he, and he's very interested in what he calls medicine's healing role, a very ancient role of doctors to be healers, the wounded healer. And what, the question we ask about that is, is euthanasia irreconcilable with medicine's mandate to heal? And um, so is, is this sort of euphemizing of euthanasia that's going on just another incremental strategy compared with a radical or a seismic shift in our basic values? And to put you in the picture at the beginning as well as at the end, uh, I think that euthanasia has been presented to societies as just a little tiny change and it's really nothing much and it's just another medical treatment and as one person described it, it's just the last act of good palliative care which all sounds friendly and nice and compassionate and merciful and those words are used and yet I believe that it is the single most important values issue of the 21st century and that what societies decide about this will decide what their future societies will be like, and in particular, what their, what will their foundational values will be. So, the first question, that, and my colleague Don Boudreau, who and I wrote this paper, uh, it's, on the, it's on the web, um, it's called Euthanizing and, um, uh, and Eulogizing Euthanasia, and that Euthanasia is not medical treatment. And, um, so the first issue that we address, because this is one of the pro-euthanasia arguments, is has death changed? And it is true that it's changed somewhat because we've got new medical technologies that prolong life, so people don't die of acute infectious diseases, they die long-term, older, of chronic diseases. And so one of the arguments is that, uh, that the medicine is to blame for that lingering death of people, and therefore it's up to medicine to, uh, to remedy that. And what Don and I argue is that we have to be very careful not to overcompensate in our bid for atonement, that we have to not disown the ethical tradition or the basic precepts of medicine, let alone of society. And we also go on to argue that uh, legalizing euthanasia would do very serious harm to medicine and to its value-carrying role in society. And there's a, uh, there's a paradox here because in our societies, it used to be religion that carried the, va for, that carried the value for society of respect for life. And in a secular society, and especially in a multicultural, multi-religious, pluralistic society, you can't use religion to do that. And so the two institutions that now carry the value of respect for life are law, which says you must not kill, and medicine, which says we will never kill. We will always do whatever we can to heal and care and comfort, but we will never kill. And so what euthanasia, and I'm using euthanasia here to include physician-assisted suicide, uh, what euthanasia does is it says it negates that value-carrying capacity because what, we, what it involves is society being complicit in changing the law 
to allow this and physicians being authorised as our, putting it very bluntly, our uh, legalised executioners. And um, so that means that those two institutions, law and medicine, have got great difficulty, if at all they can do it, of carrying that value of respect for life. And that's very important. And the other thing that people don't think about, and this is very dominant in the euthanasia debate, almost all of the discussion and argumentation is at the individual level of the individual person who wants euthanasia, who's in a terrible situation where rightly our hearts go out to them and we think we wouldn't want to be in that situation. Maybe if I were in that situation, I'd think of euthanasia. And so that's the very strongest case for euthanasia, that individual level plea and claim and even argue, people argue it's a right. But you also have to look at the impact of euthanasia at the general or societal level. And so even if you could say that euthanizing a competent, consenting adult who was terminally ill and in terrible suffering, even if you could say that doesn't disrespect that person's right to life because this is what they want, it still contravenes and breaches respect for life at the general societal level. And you've got to maintain respect for life at both those levels. And that is what, it's that general societal level of what euthanasia will do there that isn't considered sufficiently at all. Now, the euthanasia, the pro-euthanasia people are now, at least in Canada, um, are labelling themselves as the people who adopt so-called progressive values. And so it's a whole package of those progressive values. And at the base of them is very dominantly is the right to individual autonomy, the right of self-determination, the right to choose for yourself what happens, and this idea of choice, that choice is paramount. And um, I, was at, uh, I was at a conference a few weeks ago and one of our Supreme Court of Canada judges was at the conference. And um, that's the same as the High Court of Australia. It's the top court in Canada. And she referred to what she called restrictive values. So we're the restrictivists. We don't like this. We say no. no. And so when you've got progressive and restrictive, they're being used as the opposites. And so I've just written a paper where I've started to talk about the, uh, the permissives. Instead of calling them progressives, let's call them permissives and restrictives because the opposite of restriction is permission. And so the, the, what is happening there is that you've got a questioning of authority, you've got this absolute focus on having control in fact, I think that's one of the I think that's one of the reasons why euthanasia is coming up here. That when, when people are frightened of anything that involves a mystery, so they turn a mystery into a problem, and then so the mystery of death becomes the problem of death, and you then seek a technological solution to the problem of death, and that is uh, a lethal injection. And you might not be able to avoid death. You can't avoid death, but you can, with euthanasia, you can have a feeling of control of its timing, of its place, of how it occurs. And so I, I think, and I think that part of that is to deal with the fear of death because control reduces fear and anxiety. And uh, some of these, um, Social psychologists who look at the uh, psychology of a society, they believe a society has got a psyche, not just people have a, uh, have a psyche. And they're talking about what they call terror management devices or terror reduction mechanisms. And so one of the things that I've been interested in lately is that is euthanasia a terror reduction mechanism in the face of death. And that when we can't deal with death as we did in the past, usually, most people did through a religious belief, 
that you're in a secular society where there's nothing that you can hold on to to deal with this what you perceive as a total calamity taking you over, then euthanasia offers some ways of dealing with that. Um, what we also see is that there's a great questioning of authority by progressivists, these progressive values people. And um, I, just, I was saying to someone tonight that I just noted that Pope Francis had a wonderful phrase that I just saw in one of the speeches that he gave, gave and he talked about adolescent progressivism. And what that, what that is, is that when you, adolescents reject authority, adolescents think that everything needs to be changed, and those are real features of what is happening in the euthanasia debate with the pro-euthanasia argument. The other thing that is also uh, common to uh, that group is, and perhaps because I live in Quebec, um, I, I experience this much more strongly than I think you probably do here in Australia at the moment, but there is an absolute rampant hostility to religion. It is, it is incredible, it is absolutely incredible. And it isn't helped, of course, by these, in, these awful abuses that are taking place in some regions of the world in the name of religion. But the Quebec legislation uh, that Paul mentioned, this act with respect to end-of-life care, the <coughs> Quebec government went to a great deal of uh, trouble having uh, hearings about whether or not it should try to, it would legislate in favor of euthanasia. And uh, they then put out a report of a special legislative committee called Dying with Dignity. So you know from the title what the report's going to do. But one of the, and they put out the report totally in favor of legalizing euthanasia, despite the fact that 64% of the witnesses that appeared before that committee opposed euthanasia. And what the, how they dealt with that was to say, well, they were all religious, so we just count them as one, and we count everybody else on the other side as individual people opposing this. I mean, it was, it was absolutely appalling. But one of the things in it, they, they dealt with what they called the sanctity of life. And they said, well, that used to be a value for Quebec society, when Quebec was a religious society, but we've moved on and religion no longer plays a role in what we do in terms of law or public policy. We are now a secular society. They're not just secular, they're absolutely hostile to anything religious. So one way that they get rid of a value that they don't like is to label it religious or to label the person who promotes it as religious and then say, well, we don't have to think about that because religion doesn't count in our society, so therefore that, that's irrelevant. Um, quite, it's quite amazing, actually, and it's quite uh, sort of sobering to live in a society where that's the case. Just as an aside, I would urge you never to speak of sanctity of life because sanctity goes with religion and then it's easy to label it religion and dismiss it. Speak of respect for life, which means the same thing, and then talk about what you mean by respect for life, and then talk about how in all societies in which reasonable people would want to live, you have to have respect for life. It's one of the most fundamental values. Um, we've also, I mean, we have got so much going on in this area in Canada that it's almost impossible to keep up with it. We have a case that's come out of British Columbia called the Carter case, where the judge um, held that it was a breach of, we, we have a charter of human rights and freedoms in Canada, which is part of the constitution of the country. And Article 7 says you've got a right to life, liberty and security of the person. And the judge in this Carter case, which was a challenge to wipe out the assisted suicide cr federal criminal prohibition, uh, they said it was a breach of this woman's right to life not to let her have 
assisted suicide. Now, you've got to be pretty ingenious to think about how could it possibly be a breach of a right to life not to let someone have help in committing suicide. Well, here's what the judge held. The judge held that this woman who had Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, that if she couldn't have assisted suicide, it meant that she would have to commit suicide sooner while she was still able to do it all by herself. But if she could have assisted suicide, she wouldn't commit suicide at that time. She'd wait until later and have that other person help her to commit suicide, therefore prohibiting her from having assistance in suicide actually shortened her life and that was a breach of right to life under the Constitution. Yeah, I know. It, it, I mean, it's, it, it's mind-boggling what you have to deal with in Canada, truly. And um, so what has now happened, it so happened that there was a Supreme Court of Canada precedent a case called Rodriguez from 1994, where by a one judge majority in the Supreme Court, they held that the prohibition of assisted suicide was constitutionally valid. And um, so the, it went to a court of appeal, and the court of appeal just said, look, this is contrary to the Supreme Court of Canada precedent. And so they reversed the trial court's judgment but now what's happened, it's on appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. I'm actually involved with, uh, in an intervenous status for people with disabilities uh, who are protesting, taking away the, the prohibition of assisted suicide because they said we'll be, we'll be the people who'll be vulnerable and who'll be abused if you do this. And um, uh, so it remains to be seen what the Supreme Court will do, but keep in mind, that my friend, who she actually is a friend of mine, the judge on the Supreme Court of Canada, who talks about restrictives, is not too keen on restrictives. So I'm pretty sure there's one vote that we're not going to get on the Supreme Court of Canada. So anyway, so that's sort of the background to this. Now, why else shouldn't we do this? Well, this is more to do with medicine. First of all, we've got the Hippocratic Oath, which is nearly two and a half thousand years old. And what the Hippocratic Oath did, it's very interesting when you look into the history. You know, we talked about medicine men and witch doctors. And so it used to be that the same person in the human group, whether it was a tribe or a community or whatever it was, who was the healer was also the killer because you could get the medicine man to kill your enemy or somebody who'd cursed you or whatever it was. but was also the person you went to when you were sick. And what the Hippocratic Oath did was it separated those two roles of a physician, the killer from the healer. And what euthanasia would do is reunite after two and a half thousand years those two roles. And that's why we think it's a very, very bad thing for medicine. Um, and if we looked in writing this article, we looked into... Um, uh, the history that had been written about how you helped dying people. And there's a long history of that. And we've got a wonderful, uh, one of the best uh, history of medicine libraries in the world at McGill University, where I am. It's called the Osler Library. And uh, we got old books from, even from uh, 1500s, old documents. And it told you what you were allowed to do to help a dying person but what was absolutely clear in all of this literature right up until the current euthanasia debate was that you must never kill. You could do things to ease the pain, to ease the suffering. You could help. You didn't have to officiously prolong life. They did things like lay the person on the ground and probably my colleague who's the lung specialist said maybe that you know they died more quickly then because they weren't breathing so well and they were on the ground. and all those sorts of things, but, you, but it made it very clear that you must not kill. And there were warnings about the destruction of trust between people in general and medicine as a profession if doctors turned into killers. And another thing that we looked at was what I've called in past writing that I've done, the medical cloak, 
why are we putting a medical cloak on all of this and what would it do if we took it off? And uh, so one of the things we looked at there was capital punishment in the US. And what they were finding in the US was that juries were unwilling to convict people or to condemn people to capital punishment because the anti-capital punishment people had put these horrific videos on YouTube and also they were on television news of people being fried to death in an electric chair and the executions going wrong and people dying in agony. So what the Americans came up with was, well, let's do this nicely, gently, peacefully, and so we'll give people lethal injections. Although you might have read in the press recently that some of those have been going wrong. And that now that's been considered, is it uh, cruel and unusual treatment or punishment, or is it torture? So that's if, when you're using it as capital punishment, it's torture. When you're using it as euthanasia, which is using the same drug, same procedure, it's compassion and it's mercy. Anyway, um, so there's, the, and the medical association said that um, doctors must not be involved in that, that it was antithetical to the role of doctors to be involved in capital punishment. But some Texan doctors nevertheless volunteered because they're very keen on uh, capital punishment down in Texas. And um, so, it's also, a uh, part of this medical cloak is also the language that is used. Uh, they decide, the pro-euthanasia people decided to abandon the language of suicide and euthanasia because what they found in surveys was that when they used that language, uh, people, m m many less people would support it than if they didn't use the language. In fact, in Oregon, they found that when they used the word suicide, the, surveying the same people, uh, when they asked them, did they believe in medically assisted death? And then they asked them, did they believe in physician assisted suicide? 12% less people agreed with suicide than agreed with medically assisted death, even though it meant exactly the same thing. So there's this whole, uh, uh, important sort of obfuscation. I call it. I call it legalizing euthanasia by confusion. Um, we also had a big survey in Canada in September last year, and they surveyed over 2,000 Canadians across the country, over a thousand of whom were in Quebec. And in this act <coughs> that Quebec has passed, they don't use the word euthanasia. They use the term medically assisted death which I happily use as MAD, M-A-D. And, um, uh, and what they found was that two-thirds of Quebecers who agreed with medically assisted death did not understand it meant a lethal injection. They did not understand that. They thought it meant the right to pain relief treatment. They thought it meant the right to refuse treatment. They didn't understand it meant a lethal injection. And when they used the word euthanasia, and this is almost unbelievable, 40% of people didn't understand that euthanasia meant a lethal injection. So there's a, when you're talking about what the polls show and what people want, then you're getting very warped figures because they don't understand what they're talking about. And uh, so I've adopted a practice which has got me into, it's one reason I didn't get the Order of Canada, which has got me into no end of trouble. I talk about doctors killing patients. And um, I actually, several years ago, I was invited to give a speech at the um, Australian Medical Association National Conference in Canberra. And so I, and they asked me to give it on euthanasia. I've been writing about this topic for well over 30 years, actually. I can't believe it myself, but it's true. And um, anyway, I don't know whether any of you know Roger Hunt, who's a friend of mine. He's a palliative care physician here in uh, Adelaide. And he's one of the few palliative care physicians that is in favor of euthanasia. Uh, the figures show that around 92% of palliative care physicians oppose euthanasia. Anyway, I kept saying we can't have doctors killing patients. And so Roger leapt to his feet. There are about 600 doctors present at this conference. And he shouted out for me. He was down the back. He shouted out, Margot, will you stop using that word killing? 
He said, it's not killing. He said, it's V-A-E. And I said, well, what's V-A-E? And he said, oh, it's voluntary active euthanasia. So we don't even use the word. We use a, an acronym for it. So I said, oh, you know, I just went on. So later in the speech, I came to, and this is what I want to talk to you about now, is, uh, well, if we're going to have euthanasia, don't let's pollute and destroy medicine and its role. Let's get some other group of people to do this. And th so the question was, well, if you're going to do that, who are you going to get to be the euthanasias? They're even suggesting a new name for them now. They're being called thanatologists. And um, this is, and I, that, I, I'm not kidding, that's from an article in the New England Journal of Medicine by very distinguished researchers. Anyway, um, uh, so uh, I said, well, if we can't have physicians, who are we going to have? And the answer to that, and this was not my original idea, it was from an article in uh, Perspectives in Biology and Medicine, very respected journal out of the University of Chicago. The answer is, well, let's have a specially trained group of lawyers. And the reason for that is that you've got to have somebody who can strictly interpret the law and apply it properly. And lawyers, that's what lawyers are trained to do. And with that, Roger leapt to his feet and he screamed at me from the back of the audience, Margot, are you crazy? He said, you'd have lawyers killing people? <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't killing when it was doctors, but it was killing when it was lawyers. So, so, so I suggest um, that, we, um, that we, we definitely, for a whole heap of reasons, and you can read the papers, there's two papers we've written on this that are both on the, they're both available for free on, uh, on the academic website. Um, and um, so this new discipline of thanatologists, we have to decide who they'd be, how they'd be trained, and what would be the scope of their practice. And Don and I make it very clear that we don't agree with euthanasia at all, that we think it is inherently wrong. But if it's gonna happen, uh, and actually our purpose in doing this is to try to get people to perceive what they're actually doing, um, then it should, if this is what we would have to do. And so we then we wanted, went to look for where could we find a precedent for how you would train these thanatologists. And what we came up with was the Hangman, this is a proper book, it's the Hangman's Bible from 19th century England and it had a training program in it for the hangman, and they had to pass an exam, and they had to perform in front of a, uh, a governor. And so we looked at that, and we said, well, this is what you would, um, these would be the sorts of things that you'd have to look at. But we also very strongly brought up, because both of us teach medical students, and we said, well, can you really imagine standing up in front of a class of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, dying-to-cure-the-world medical students and teaching them how to kill their patients. I mean, can you really imagine doing that? And, um, and role-modeling it for them. And what about if people made it what's called, uh, it has, it's an, uh, a, a required procedure. I don't know about here in medical school in Australia, but in Canada, there's a, for medical schools, there's a list of required procedures and you can't graduate with your medical degree until you've actually carried out those required procedures and shown that you're competent in them. And we've relatively recently uh, had a movement by a group of feminist medical students who were trying to make abortion a required procedure, a required procedure in medical schools in Canada. Well, what if euthanasia were a required procedure? And also, what about the fact that a lot of, you know, we know that the single biggest group who oppose legalizing euthanasia is physicians. On the whole, it's somewhere, depending on the survey you look at, between 70 and 80% of physicians absolutely reject it. Imagine sitting down to lunch with your colleague who 10 minutes before has given a lethal injection to somebody. 
I often say to people, you know, I, I am, I'm sort of pretty keen on cats, as my friends know. And when you've got a cat that is really, really sick and there's nothing else you can do and it's suffering terribly, and the vet comes to give the cat a lethal injection, I mean, that is sobering and terrible enough. But imagine doing that to a person. And um, so, it's, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary situation. And I think one of our problems is that we're only looking at it in relation to that individual person who's got somebody who supports them, who says, yes, let's have euthanasia, where you feel there is a terrible, you know, an awful situation that you don't want to have to face and we've got no other way to deal with it. And so one of the things is that we have to try to work out other ways to deal with it. The other thing is that if we legalize this, and this is already happening in the jurisdictions that have euthanasia or assisted suicide, there will be protocols for what's called in inverted commas, successful euthanasia. And these protocols are now being published. This is how you go about it. This is the conversation you should have with your patient who wants euthanasia. What we are also seeing emerging is clinical practice guidelines for euthanasia. And these are probably going to be um, divided into various categories of disease. So this will be your protocol for euthanasia for someone of dying of lung cancer, your protocol for euthanasia of somebody dying, let's say, of uh, uh, heart failure or whatever, or cancer or whatever it might be. And um, what is uh, that focus will expand. If you, if you treat euthanasia as medical treatment, then you're going to get all the <laughs> usual ways in which we validate, verify, and apply medical treatment. It will, it will be uh, subsumed into the general medical context. And um, the other problem, and this is another problem that's very major league at the moment in Canada, and you've got it here in Australia too, particularly in Victoria because of the act that governs abortion, uh, it's freedom of conscience. So if, if, as is being said, both here in Australia and in Canada, that doctors are people who are paid by the public they owe a service to the public, their, tra their education is paid for by the public, therefore they owe a duty to give patients the procedures they want, providing those procedures are not illegal, then would they be required to provide euthanasia to people who fulfill the criteria and who want euthanasia? Uh, that, that has been debated under the Quebec legislation and what, what the legislation currently says is that if you've got conscientious objection to euthanasia, you do not have to carry it out yourself, but you do have to report the case to the Director of uh, Professional Services, and that person has a legal obligation to find somebody who will carry out euthanasia. So it makes you complicit in the carrying out of euthanasia, which the doctors object to as well. What they're finding in the Netherlands, uh, which has got legalized euthanasia, is that doctors are unwilling to carry out euthanasia. So the Netherlands very recently has set up six mobile euthanasia units, which are ambulances, which are equipped and staffed to carry out euthanasia in a person's home. And they're hoping that that is going to mean that people who want euthanasia will be able to get it without any problems. So those are, you know, those are some of the some of the issues. I mean, what I what I want to point out to you tonight is the vast range of issues that this raises. It's not just an issue of a sick person who wants this and can consent to it. Um, just an, and I mean, of course, another issue is. Uh, the slippery slopes that this involves. Now, the people who are pro-euthanasia say that there's no slippery slope. But there are two kinds of slippery, slippery slope. There's the um, logical slippery slope that once you legalize this, you can't stop it expanding. And that is proven true in both Netherlands and Belgium. And the practical slippery slope is that once you step over the line and you legalize this killing, 
then people get used to doing it and they do it in circumstances in which it is not legal. It's the abuse of the euthanasia. And uh, certainly uh, that's what they're seeing in a major way in the Netherlands and Belgium. And um, I've recently written an article on that as to why that happens. And I believe that the answer is it happens because the justification is built into legalizing euthanasia. And once you legalize it, you can't stop it. Because what, how it works is that in both Belgium and the Netherlands, when they first legalized euthanasia, they said, well, the justification is respect for the individual's autonomy. This is what they want, and they've got the right to decide. It's their life, their body, uh, and it is the relief of suffering. That is, they've, you know, they're in this terrible situation and you've got to relieve the suffering. And what then happened is that those, that joint or conjoint justification gets broken apart and people say, well, maybe it's enough if it's autonomy and this is what they want. Why do they have to really be suffering? So what we're seeing in the Netherlands is people who are depressed, um, who are, are being euthanized. The Netherlands is currently considering whether if you're over 70 and tired of life, that's enough as long as you say, well, I want this. And then on the other hand, they say, well, if you're suffering but you're not mentally competent to exercise your autonomy, why shouldn't you have euthanasia? It's a discrimination to let people who are competent have it to relieve their suffering and not to let the people who are incompetent have it. So therefore you should allow people with Alzheimer's or you know, other dementias to have access to euthanasia. And that is certainly what is happening. And I had a, um, and once you say, once you say, well, let's expand, those are expansions of the justifications. And once you get used to that, you say, well, why not some other justifications? And even five years ago, it was unthinkable, and certainly the pro-euthanasia people totally denied it, that you would say that euthanasia would ever be used as a cost-saving mechanism uh, for saving costs in your healthcare system. And now that is, that's being seriously discussed in the literature, that we've got aging populations, they're getting predictions of the rates of dementia, they're saying we can't afford to look after these people, we have to do something about it. And um, a couple of months ago, I was teaching in the medical school, and I was teaching a class of final year medical students who in uh, about two weeks after I was teaching them were going to graduate with their MD degrees. And uh, this young man got up, because I was, as you can tell tonight, I was arguing that you know you should not be involved in euthanasia, your young doctors, that's not something you should even contemplate doing. And um, this young man got up and he said, look, he said, what you're saying is not feasible. He said, of course we've got to consider euthanasia and of course we've got to have it. He said, we can't afford it. Our healthcare system can't afford <coughs> to look after all these people. Now that's a graduating medical student telling you that you know, a cost saving will be a sufficient justification for euthanasia. Which, is, which I found very, very frightening. So um, those are some of, the, um, some of the things that are happening. Um, there's a, a, the argument, the, a, the, a principal argument on the pro-euthanasia side is that we already recognize rights to refuse treatment. We recognize, as we definitely should, rights to fully adequate pain management. In fact, I believe it's a breach of human rights to, leave, to intentionally leave someone in pain. And then they argue um, that this is a right to die, a right to be killed, but it's not. I, I do not believe this is just an incremental change from what we're recognizing there, that um, what we are, what we're doing in euthana in legalizing euthanasia, is uh, is a major radical change. So a question is, and this is really in conclusion because I want to hear your questions: Is euthanasia just an incremental expansion 
of current ethically and legally accepted end-of-life decisions, such as refusal of life support treatment, as pro-euthanasia advocates argue, or is it acting with an in, or, or is acting with an intention to kill different in kind from allowing a natural death? I believe it's different in kind, not just different in degree. Is euthanasia medical treatment? I hope I've pointed out to you the dangers, I think, of considering it as medical treatment. And we have to ask, what are the dangers to patients, to the trust-based physician-patient relationship, and to medicine of defining it as medical treatment? Should we take the medical cloak off euthanasia and have some specially trained persons other than physicians mandated to administer it if our governments go ahead and legalize it. If euthanasia is permitted, how do we think our great-great-grandchildren will die? And I think what we would find, I think there's very good evidence of this, that euthanasia would become the norm. It would be the way that a very large percentage of people would die. Um, in the, under the Quebec legislation, they argued this is only for rare cases. What we now know is that a minimum of 4% of all deaths in the Netherlands are by euthanasia, and that's the recorded deaths. The real figure is probably much higher. Uh, we also know that there's a big increase, it's increasing by about 13% a year, of what's called palliative sedation, but which is really terminal sedation. It's this uh, total sedation being used as a form of slow euthanasia. Um, and what kind of society will we have left to our grand, great great grandchildren if we legalize euthanasia? Will it be one in which no reasonable person was, would want to live? Why don't most politicians and many people recognize the momentousness of a decision to legalize euthanasia. It's, it's not just an inc incremental change, but a radical and massive shift in our societies and civilization's foundational values. And I predict that history will see each society's decision about euthanasia as its turning point values decision of the 21st century. Thank you.